Deductive reasoning is under attack. This is not fear-mongering, this is not an exaggeration. I feel like I've used this intro before. Anyways, bear with me if this video is a little drier than most, because I want to go over a concept that I've said in the past many people get wrong. Even though it's a fairly simple and abstract concept, at least at face value. In fact, to be honest, there's probably several videos that I could make out of this one concept. We could go into the square of opposition, we could go into depth about categorical relationships, or propositional statements. But if my head hurts from reading up on this stuff and trying to grasp terminology that conflicts with colloquial usage and as such seems counterintuitive, then I probably imagine it won't be that much fun for you either. So instead of going into depth, I'm going to try to keep this brief and keep it in my own words. It seems as though people have forgotten how the very concept of deduction works. And by that, I mean it seems as though a lot of people's arguments are just assuming that things are mutually exclusive when they are not, or assuming that things are not mutually exclusive when they are, and in general just not understanding the concept of exclusion. So, let's talk about that. Because first of all, if I asked you if you knew a word for when two things cannot be true at once, I imagine I know what your response will be. Obviously, earlier I said mutually exclusive, but uh, now I am referring to the term contradiction or contradictory, which I would assume is a no-brainer. But why I bring this up is to ask if any of you said contriety, or if even now after hearing me say that, go, oh yeah, uh, contriety, I'm very familiar with that, of course. Although obviously, contrary is probably something we all are actually familiar with. However, here comes the confusion I alluded to earlier, which I won't get into depth about, but it seems as though contrary is contrary to popular use in this sense. Whereas we generally think of contrary meaning opposite, here in philosophy that's actually the term contradictory. Contradictory means that the two are negations of one another. If A is true, then B is not. If B is true, then A is not. On the other hand, if these two terms were merely in a contrary propositional relationship, although never being true at the same time, both could be false at the same time. Whereas in a contradictory relationship, they can never share the same value, being mutually exclusive. If the terminology is at all tripping you up, just think opposites versus alternatives. But if you're up to speed and you're like, why am I watching this? Then let's start testing some implications, beginning with a riddle of sorts. If a robot could come up with any number at random, and it asked you to guess the number, given that you are permitted two guesses, one of which must be right, and your numbers must be expressed as either contrary or contradictory to one another, which would you choose? I don't know if I'm good at riddles. In case you didn't know, the answer is contradictory. For example, if you say my numbers are 1 and not 1, or any other number in the place of 1, you win. Obviously, any not number is going to have an increasingly high chance of being picked, but including that same number as an affirmative instead of a negative 100% guarantees it no matter the length of numbers from which that number is chosen. And in this example, a set of contrary numbers would be like 1 and 2, 5 and 3, or any other number in a number it is not. Which finally brings us to why I think this concept is so fascinating, and perhaps even confusing for some, and the reason that we see issues like this kind of pop up in arguments from time to time. There is a difference between not being something and being something that is not. 3 is not 5, but it is not not 5. And again, the irony here is that that is seemingly false. But I don't mean that as a double negative. I mean 3 is literally not the concept of not 5. It technically is a part of that concept, but so is 6, 7, 8, 9, all numbers that are not 5. So not only do I think it's weird that through negation we just invoke the concept of negative infinity on a daily basis, this odd relationship between affirmatives positives, whatever you want to call it, and negatives leads to a lot of issues, a litany of which involve the concept of false dichotomy, whether it's calling out false dichotomies or people crying out false dichotomies when none are present. Because for example, a dichotomy that involves a contradiction can never be a false dichotomy. It is either one or the other. That isn't a false choice when, by definition, that is just the case. In addition to that, not all seemingly contrary propositions are false dichotomies either. Even though, generally speaking, your typical false dichotomy is a contrary relationship, portrayed as a contradictory relationship in which there are no other choices. But if my word choice of seemingly contrary is any indication there, the other side of this coin is people portraying contradictory relationships as contrary. Sure, if I pick a random number, then the statement is either 5 or 3 is a false dichotomy if I could have chosen any number at random between 
1 and 10, for example. However, if it proceeded before this statement that you asked me, is it 7, is it 6, on and on until there were just two numbers left, then unless I lied about picking a number, these numbers are now in contradiction under the information I provided. It is either 5 and not 3, or 3 and not 5. Here we see that 3 is the concept of not 5 if, and only if, 3 and 5 are in a contradictory relationship. In the same way, if we are given the conditional statement, if A, then B, logically we can conclude that if we exhaust all other possible cases that must imply B as a consequence, then it must follow that it is not B. Which brings this all to a fascinating close, because this statement devoid of this is simply, if not A, then not B. Which, given the premise, if A, then B, is denying the antecedent, a formal fallacy. One that I and others find to be common, in fact more common than its counterpart affirming the consequent. If I said, if it rains, the ground will be wet, and then said, it did not rain, therefore the ground is not wet, the flaw in that may sneak by you, whereas I've found that saying, the ground is wet, therefore it rained, makes it far more apparent. There are other reasons, other alternatives, as to why the ground may be wet. This is true of both statements. I think the reason denying the antecedent is far more common than affirming the consequent is twofold. One, I think there's a sort of causal bias where we believe that the statement is asking, if this does not happen, will it have the effect of, well, not happening? If it is not going to rain, then it will not be wet from the rain. Secondly, we take for granted how much this little conditional changed our argument, as we use reasoning like this all the time. In fact, this other little conditional isn't that special, merely being another thing that does not imply B. So really, all we have is, if nothing implies B, it is not B. Which is, you know, no duh. But what is it that we forgot? Because I said we forgot the importance of this, so what is this? Well, it's going through and systematically eliminating everything until one thing is left. And that is deductive reasoning. Which I think is just a very interesting way of thinking about deductive reasoning, and all of it, really. It's just fascinating how complicated things can get when you get down to what should be the simpler concepts. And so I'm sorry if I can't really wrap this video up in a neat little bow because of that, but it's just something I enjoy talking about, and so hopefully you gained something from it. But if you didn't, it's too late now.